Okay, so even the term of enlightenment was kind of already in the Vedic tradition. It's in the yogic, all the That's yogic right. traditions, okay. you know, Maharaji, Yogi, this, that, and the other. They all have this notion of enlightenment. Sometimes they call it illuminated. Sometimes they call it transcended. You know, however you want to translate it from the Sanskrit. This fundamental notion of some profound spiritual attainment is possible. And to some okay. extent, at least some Buddhists will claim, okay, this was a move away from that into a, a different way of engaging in deal with. Among other things, you know, it's not sufficient simply that you worship some gods and that they tap you on the shoulder and then off you go. That the whole notion of liberation, which is the operative term for enlightenment in Buddhism, happens through a very specific methodology and way. It was trying to dispel a whole lot of ritual, a whole lot of doctrine, and also a whole lot of philosophy. And one of the things to bear in mind in this is that, you know, as sophisticated as Greece was in the Axial Age, in those sort of few hundred years from whatever, 600 BC to 300 BC, that same period saw a similar flowering in India, where you had umpteen philosophers writing extraordinary texts. The first text of grammar was written at this time in Sanskrit, you know. But one very important difference is that there's a sense in which theology and philosophy didn't suffer the kind of separation it seems to have. At least when we look at, you know, Greece from this modern day, we say, oh, well, there was, of course, they believed in various gods, but they had their philosophy and those two were different. You never had that separation in the East, neither in India nor in China. Philosophy and theology are never properly separatable. Does that sound right to you guys? It's not reflected so much in what we read, which is, for the most part, very secular. It, certainly from the description I gave of the Lotus Sutra, Buddha himself was uh, deified, certainly, in the tradition. Even though one of the things you hear about Buddhism is it's uh, fundamentally atheistic, that there's not you know, a god underlying everything or something like this, still... Anybody that's a hero in any culture pre-modern age is going to be deified at some point. So not only Buddha, but Nagarjuna in this whole story about the sea snakes and stuff like this. So we can do our best to kind of giggle at that and, or, you know, look for the actual philosophical core right. of what's in there, apart from any dogmatism. Well, let's not forget, in modern China, Mao got deified. Mao, strictly speaking, is a demigod. Very nice. So, <laughs> so Mahayana comes along. I know one of the big differences was just the idea that instead of just trying to escape the cycle of birth and redeath, you want to have compassion and come back and help other people and become a bodhisattva. That's the new goal, that you're not trying to just, it's not nihilistic. You're not just trying to escape everything. You're trying to bring everybody else to enlightenment so that the, ultimately the goal is that every single soul that exists would be enlightened, not just you trying to get out of there. Well, we got the Buddha it sort of comes out of this Vedic context, and then bad Vedic habits creeps back into Buddhism over the several hundred years that followed Buddha. And this is where Nargujana then enters the picture, and where you then have this sort of equivalent of a reformation happen. And the idea is to sort of purify and get back to what Buddha was talking about, and not to have all this new doctrine, new rituals. At least this is the claim of what are then many Mahayana Buddhists. And in many respects, Nargujana is the person that is pointed to as sort of the Luther, you know, mm -hmm. of this reformation. I guess one of the things that I heard growing up about Buddhism is that, oh, they don't believe in God, they believe in the void. That if you look what's underneath all of the physical things that you see, your idea of yourself is profound nothingness. So in other words, there is an ontology, a list of things that are, but what is in it is this void, which is, you know, you might as well call it the Tao. Whereas reading this, it seemed it was a lot more subtle than that, this pure nothingness, because that sounds like a very nihilistic philosophy. And because if you really think that, why pursue ethical action? I mean, you might say there's the Eightfold Path because, oh, I have to be selfless to people because I want to attain nirvana. I want to get away from my urges that are bringing me suffering. And so therefore I should be ethical. But there's no reason, it's not that I actually have a responsibility to other people because ultimately those other people are not real. And I'm not real. This knife that I'm stabbing you with is not real. And the raping that's going on next door is not real. So it really undermines, it's a very self-defeating sort of philosophy to really take seriously the idea that all is void. This is all just illusion. 
Well, right. I think that's more of a Western trivialization. I found in my experience that I mostly hear that talking to Christians, you know, who just utterly don't understand, okay. you know, what's going on. Well, I'm, that's, yeah. I just wanted to voice so, that yeah, no, just no, to, to get enough, that out fair there. Enough. And it's also partly due to folks like Schopenhauer. And if you look at the way people take Nietzsche, of course, you know, they say, oh, he's a nihilist. He doesn't believe in anything. And it's like, well... And maybe sit down and read the book first or something. Let me throw something in here then. This idea of that Mark just mentioned of nothingness and a Western view of, well, if you're going to try to tell people to act a certain way, if you're going to try to give them an ethical system or give them a morality, there has to be something that backs it up, that underlies it. And so we have a very well-developed metaphysics that underlies the ethical system that we accept in the West. And because we have that, when we look at these other cultures, we say, oh, well, if you're going to tell me to act a certain way, then you're going to have to somehow justify telling me to do that. So for our view, simplistically, we say, well, the goal is to get to the afterlife, the kingdom of heaven. And the way you do that is by living a virtuous life here on this earth. And the reason you want to do that is because God tells you to do it. And we have this whole series of steps we go through. And so I think we're looking for a similar kind of structure in Buddhism to say, oh, well, here, yeah, you want to live a virtuous life because the goal is to get to this point, which we call liberation or nirvana or whatever. And here's how it's underwritten by this metaphysics. What was interesting to me about this text and about trying to understand this was, in a weird way, the goal is not virtue, right action. The goal is liberation, which seems to me somehow qualitatively different than attaining the kingdom of heaven or the afterlife or whatever. And it's not the same as virtue ethics, because although virtue is important in the system, it's not the end goal. Being a virtuous person is not all there is to it. The goal is getting out of this cycle of rebirth. That just seems to me to be something fundamentally different than what I can relate to as a Westerner in kind of Western religious tradition. Properly speaking, this divide is not so much Buddhism, but East and West. This is the difference, I would say, more between just the Vedic religions altogether and the Western religions. Fundamental to Judaism is this notion of a relationship with the personalized God. And fundamental to the Vedic religions is this notion that you're in life. This is weird, but there's a way out of suffering. There's a way to achieve an enlightenment. And then Buddha is just one specific flavor of that. If you do see the attainment of heaven and the attainment of nirvana as analogous in any way, attaining nirvana, it's not a matter of divine grace. It's a matter of getting your mind to function in a certain way, to detach itself from desire, to see the ultimate lack of grounding of things. And maybe ethical action is part of what you have to do to train yourself, to get yourself on the way to that. And again, there's also the idea that once you attain nirvana for the Mahayana view, Nagarjuna is among them, then you don't actually want to escape yourself yet. You want to help everybody else escape first. So that requires that you stick around acting selflessly and lead a very ethical life. But it's still you doing it. It's not God granting you a favor. The claim by the Mahayana Buddhist is that Buddhism was becoming re-corrupted by bad metaphysics. And... Part of that led to this notion that as a Buddhist, you could basically do the Vedic thing and become an arhat, you know, a liberated person. And one of the fundamental principles in Mayana Buddhism is actually, it's not an option to become enlightened. It's not an option to become liberated. These are not actually possibilities, really, that are there for you. It's a being. You've got a body, you've got form, you've got ego. There's no getting away from it. The best you can actually do is to quit collecting it. And ultimately, in Zen, this becomes very important because what Zen people then call enlightenment isn't sort of necessarily this ultimate state. Now, there's a story, and this is a mythological story about the Buddha. It said that, you know, after he worked for lifetimes and lifetimes, doing all sorts of wonderful things like offering himself up as a sacrifice to a tiger because he felt pity for a hungry tiger and said, well, go ahead and eat me lifetimes of good deeds, right? And they did all this work. And eventually, he actually arrives at what is in this context termed heaven. And from within heaven, he hears voices saying, hey, we've been waiting for you. And he's reputed to have said, how could I actually enter heaven and leave all these people that are still in samsara? Samsara being the cycle of birth and death. Uh, yeah, I mean, or all of <laughs> illusionary reality or many ways of yeah. talking about samsara. But he's supposedly about to get the big enlightenment. He says, no, I can't do this. Now, there's two views on that. One is ethical. 
I can't do this because my compassion, like Jesus, right, pulls me back to the world and I mm -hmm. must seek out the liberation and the cessation of suffering for all sentient beings. There's also a metaphysical take on it, which is this is not possible. It's ontologically impossible to attain a state of enlightenment because enlightenment intrinsically is a unified state. And as long as you have beings that are not in an enlightened state, then the whole cannot be enlightened. And the only thing that can meaningfully be enlightened is the whole. This is a fundamental departure from the traditional Vedic thinking. Because all of a sudden, you know, hey, even that's been taken off the table. There is no escape from this. The option that they leave you with is this notion of being a bodhisattva, which is being a being who's made a promise to sort of go against the grain and try and cause a cessation of suffering and help sentient beings, but is not actually enlightened. Buddha in training. Yeah, but Buddha in training for yet many more lifetimes. And, you know, you get texts yes. on how many lifetimes. All right, now to Nagarjuna, <laughs> right. finally. He's the founder of this early school within the Mahayana tradition, which is... Uh... Madhyamika. Okay, Madhyamika is how I was initially pronouncing it. The same video was Vajyamika, like Hanukkah, <laughs> that, to make me think of that. So what this means is the view of the middle way, something like that. And the reason it's called the middle way, and in fact, one of their big texts, which is one that we skimmed for today, is the foundation stanzas of the middle way, or also translated as verses from the center. But it's the middle way is between seeing everything is real, right? So it's the things of your experience have this absolute reality, and that's just what reality is, objective scientific reality. and this nihilism of, no, everything is illusory. What's ultimately real is nothingness. He's trying to go between those two, the middle way. And the way he does that is to say, it's not that things don't really exist. It's that these phenomena that we encounter in our experience, they have emptiness. So they do not have inherent existence. You do not have, oh, I'm going to use another word, svabhava, this inherent existence. I mean, you could say objective existence, but that doesn't quite capture it because we have phenomenologists or pragmatists We've already even discussed in some of these episodes the idea of, you know, if both of us are in a room and I drop a rock on the ground and you see it fall and I see it fall, it seems like that rock and what it just did has objective existence just because it has intersubjective verifiability. And for scientific purposes, that's all you need. But that's not to say maybe, maybe we're in the matrix, right? So it has an objective existence in that it's uh, part of the program, part of our shared delusion, but it's not real in a way that the philosopher would want it to be. You could still wake up from the matrix and see that it was all bogus. So I think the matrix works very well as an image for what uh, Nagarjuna sees our reality. I mean, he talks about dreams a lot and compares our experiences to the, yeah, okay, you could talk that there was an object in that dream. You could describe there was a chair, it was red, it has properties, it caused something else to happen, but you're still talking about a dream. Right? So there's conventional reality, which is what he calls all this, and it still has cause and effect. You could still do science, and there's still ethical implications. But ultimately, under that is the ultimate reality, which is the recognition of the underlying. But you don't even want to say it's nothingness, because that's making a positive metaphysical statement that is contradicting the metaphysical statement of the solidity of the things in front of us. So it's, it's something else. It's some kind of escape. It's really recognition of emptiness is the true reality. Emptiness is not the same thing as nothingness because nothingness implies that there could be a something and emptiness is somehow supposed to be a neutral term where there's not a full and an empty. There's just simply emptiness. This is where it gets very hard to talk about. I think yes. nothingness is a very poorly chosen term. I think that actually one of the reasons that, for example, in the translations that we were looking at, that the term emptiness is used is precisely for that reason. Nothingness is a distinct term, especially in the context of Nargujana's writings here. Emptiness is not a, um, a dichotomy. Yes, that's kind of the key points is that that middle way, in a kind of way, it's a solution to the problem of being and becoming. That if you look at the Western tradition and you see all the people who deal with the issue of being and non-being, particularly when we start talking about them as predicates, you know, like trying to say like something does mm -hmm. not exist. Like what is that something and how do we talk about it not existing and how is existence a predicate and all that sort of thing. But even going back to our episode on quantum physics, when we talked about the pre-Socratics, you know, there was a real issue with trying to understand the concept of change and whether or not there were 
actual things that became other things, or if everything was static and you were just getting different properties or experiences of them and all that. And this middle way is a way of trying to address that problem. At least that's the way I read it. 